Okay. Ridiculous things. <laughs> Hello, All-Star listeners, and welcome to another episode of the Veterinary Roundtable presented by All-Star Veterinary Clinic, the podcast where we answer your veterinary-related questions while having some fun along the way. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to leave us a review on your podcast provider of choice, and if you have any feedback to offer to improve the Veterinary Roundtable, let us know. We want to mention that our third episode of the Vet Clinic, the series, is now out. I'm getting a lot of love, so go check it out. And we are having 100,000 follower giveaway go to our tiktok to win a 250 dollar amazon gift card Woo yeah. how many entries do you already have harrison uh, 1300. Oh. 1300 get your name in there wow. i was gonna say it's getting pretty big that'll be great yep so on today's episode we have myself interim co-host becca miller and room assistant we have veterinary technician ashley davidson and associate veterinarian dr lauren schmoke and of course head veterinarian dr emily king Welcome, How's everyone. Doing? Hey, doing good. How are doing you? Good. I'm great. Good. I had lunch before the podcast. Smart. So I'm not hungry now because I'm always hungry when we're doing the podcast. Yeah. I like, thought about that. I was like, I should probably eat something before. All uh, day today, I've just been thinking about food. Like I'm sitting there like holding a dog and I'm like, I want my mac and cheese. She was helping so. hold a sedated cat and was like, I have homemade mac and cheese, Becca. I just want the food. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. Schmoke, you've been in surgery all morning. I've not eaten yet, but I will do that. After you will this. do that afterwards. So you're hungry. <laughs> I'll take my time in our first room to make sure you get some time to eat uh, while I get a history. <laughs> yes. That's right. <laughs> oh, gosh. So everybody's doing well. That's great. Yeah. Are you guys anticipating the snow? Um, I'm kind of waiting to see how it is because I live like 40 minutes away and I take a lot of back roads. So we'll see how it goes. But my car, it's a little beetle, Volkswagen beetle. It does really good in the snow. A lot it of does. Don't think I that wouldn't it does, believe that. But it does. Yeah. So luckily, hopefully it'll be fine. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. You we'll know. see. You never know, though. We you might never know. You never know. Yeah. We kind of have a tendency to rely on Dr. Dudley's husband, Matt's apps because he's a turf guy so he has all these like fancy apps and so his are pretty accurate so okay. he's saying what did she say this morning six to six eight. inches mm -hmm. something it was four to six and then it went up six to eight maybe? six to eight oh. yeah, i think when i looked a foot, it was around eight. two feet <laughs> call it in people it's it, yeah i'm not gonna lie i'm terrible at watching the news so i didn't know about the snow until somebody mentioned it yesterday and i was like we're getting what that's what i said too <laughs> i was not paying attention i spend way too much time doing other things so i don't watch the news which is Probably not good of me. I probably should be watching the news, but I was like, oh, snow. Yay. Let's, I mean, Sirius is going to love it. The husky in the snow, he's going to have the best time ever. Me, not as much. Not yeah. so much. Yep, yep, yep. For some reason, I thought, okay, we just avoided it all, but right? it is only January. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. We have a ways to go. We have a ways to go. We got to get to March. You're going to say it's almost February. I don't know how that's happening already, but we're almost mm -hmm. there. Pretty crazy. All right. So let's get started with some icebreakers. All right, Schmokies. In your opinion, what's the funniest word in the English language? I would have to go with phalanges. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that's such a weird word. But it is like in the phalanges. dictionary. It is. It's not yeah. made up. It is yeah. not made up. But I, apparently I say a lot of made up words because Connor is like, what did you just say? <laughs> I'm like from a very rural area and I guess... He's never heard of like mm -hmm. half my words. Just so. because he hasn't heard yeah, of them doesn't mean that they are not true words. They're Connor. adding yeah. things to the dictionary every year. So yeah. maybe eventually you can be able to pull it out and be like, see, told you. Yeah. <laughs> I said podunk last night and he just looked at me. It's like, I had to add that to the list of things is, I've never heard before. Is podunk <laughs> not a word in the dictionary? That has to be a word it in the dictionary. It has to be. That is a know. word everybody knows. Podunk means like run down, small, small town, town like, like, right? Like. Yeah. Something yeah, anytime like you talk about a podunk town, you know it's like one of these smallest towns in the middle of some, you know, country area. Like where I'm from. <laughs> I would and I would assume that that's, you know, a word in the dictionary since it's so well known, but maybe it's not. I don't know. Did you guys ever have to read that book in elementary school where it was about the kid who basically started calling a pen something else and then it eventually got into the dictionary? Huh. No. Did not. No. Yeah, okay. No, I mean, I know that. Um, so I, I mean, I read a lot. So Harry Potter is one of the ones I read. They actually added the word muggle into the dictionary really? because it was used so often because people really enjoy those books. That's how I know they add new words every year. And muggle was one of them. It was added one year Oh, that's because so funny. they were like, why not? What about you? Funniest word or weirdest word or. Hmm. I've got two probably. The first would be aglet, which is the end of a shoelace. 
So I know what it is only because my nieces were watching Phineas and Ferb, and there's a whole song about the word aglet being the end of a shoelace, and oh, nobody remembering so what it is. The other one is shenanigans. Oh, shenanigans. I love shenanigans. <laughs> I've that never is. heard of an aglet. Mm-mm. Yeah, it's not a very well-known word, but it's actually in the dictionary, and that's what it is, is that end of a shoelace yeah. that has, like, that little tape. Or when it's, like, the little metal piece, it's an aglet. Mm-hmm. A-L-G-E-T, I believe. Cool. Okay, or I'm no, A-G-L, yeah. A-G-L-E-T? Mm-hmm. Okay, learn something new every day. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? <sighs> I don't know. I have two. I think canoodle. Like, I think <laughs> that's just such a weird word. Like, let's go canoodle. Right. Like... Or like bamboozle. Like every time mm-hmm. I hear bamboozle, it just makes me smile. Yeah, so that's, a, like that's a great words. word. Good to know. Anytime she's having a bad day, I'm going to walk up and be bamboozled. like, I was bamboozled. <laughs> that's right. That could be your guys' like code word. Bamboozle. Yes. Bamboozle. Yeah. Yeah. King's going to come out of her office and be like, why are you guys just <laughs> running in circles screaming bamboozled? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, King, what's your favorite word? I, you know, I don't have any idea. I thought about this. I think the, I think I was going more for like, why is a word a word like it? Like <laughs> what? Deep. Yeah, like who decided it was a word? I think about that all the time, though. Like I'm like, why did somebody decide to call school school? Like yeah. how do they come up with that? I have no yeah. idea. And then the, it's really bad when you're like, I don't remember how to spell so, s o like so. Like you're like, oh my god, I don't remember how to spell so. And then, then like the more you think about it, then you're like, oh my god, I really don't know how to spell so. And then all of a sudden, it just like jumps in your head. Yeah. Or the ma- the more that you say a word. Or this or whatever yeah. it is. Whatever simple word yeah. is like. Oh, yeah. When you repeat a word so much when you're trying to have a conversation about it, and then about halfway through, you're like, am I even saying it right? What am I doing anymore? I have forgotten how to say the yep. word that I'm having a conversation about. Mm-hmm. Very weird. Our brains are so weird. <laughs> okay. If you could write a tell-all book about your workplace, what would it be called? I don't know. This one was hard. I'm like, I'm not like super creative by any means. Me neither. I'm like, I am like, <laughs> no. But I think like maybe like the secret life of an all star. Oh, or like that. that's yeah. not bad. Like, that would be awesome. Scenes of an all star. Okay, I, I like know. that. Yeah, that's good. Thanks, I Harrison. Kind of are you t- taking notes? <laughs> you start writing down. <laughs> Smokies, did you have anything? I had a couple. I was in surgery and Becca and I were brainstorming. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you want to hear all of them? Oh, yes. Okay. I want to hear all of them. So mine was expect the unexpected. Oh. Every day. You mm. just, you never know. What's gonna, right. You never know what we're going to get. Um, And then raining cats and dogs. That was one of them. Then we had, hey, how may I help you? That's all we say. <laughs> With <Bo> Sarah. <laughs> Uh, like all day long. Behind <laughs> the scenes of, hey, how may I help you? Yes. <laughs> and then there are donuts in the kitchen. Oh, oh my yes. God. That is day. like yeah. every yeah. day almost. Yeah. Sometimes from two different places. Yeah. Yep. Yes. The same day. Yeah. There's donuts in the kitchen and then everybody runs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. That's really funny. There are donuts in the kitchen. <laughs> what would yours be? I, I am not creative. I gosh. I mean, I. I have no ideas. I wouldn't even know what to call it. I have I got nothing for you. It's too complex. It's too complex. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm like, oh, I mean, it has to be like, you know, like involve like how everything, but yet then be funny, but yet then like I'm not yeah. good at that. So, you know, I don't. Maybe I am just more creative because I almost instantly was like, I've got it. What did you say? I would want it to be more the comedic side of everything, mm-hmm. and I would call it barking mad. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. that's good. A barking mad, and it would be the inside stories of like All Star or Vet Clinic or something like that. Yeah. Um. So then that way, you I mean you could get all the funny stories. You'd of course have to mix some of this ad in there because that's just right the reality of life. But I would want it to be that more comedic side of the things that we see and the stuff that we do. The right. amount of times that. Our clients see us as I feel like serious most of the time because we are. But on the backside of it, how many times have somebody walked out of somewhere and we're just hysterically laughing to the point of almost crying about something that we've said? And I think that having an inside tell all story of that kind of, you know, funnier aspects of things so that they can see it's not always quite as bad as you think it is. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I like that name too. You're going to have to write a book now. Yeah. Who's gonna have to write a book? You. No. <laughs> Listen, I can come up with that. A fun I would be tag equally line. as bad at. <laughs> no, so you'll come up with like the whole story. I can come up with the fun taglines. It'll be okay. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. But speaking of stories and books and things like that, one go. of my favorite places to listen to things is Audible. When I was driving an hour each way, I had Audible on all the time. 
So we actually have some exciting news. The Veterinary Roundtable now has um, an Audible affiliation. So if you use the link www.audibletrial.com backslash vet roundtable, um, you can try Audible Plus Premium for a 30-day free trial. By using the link, you'll also receive one credit or two credits if you're already an Amazon Prime member and access to thousands of titles of them that the Audible catalog has. So Harrison will hopefully add a link that you guys can see. Dr. King, what else does Audible have? Audible is one of my favorite things. We've talked about this on several podcasts. I always say leaders are readers. And so um, a lot of the content I consume involves books. But you can also find guided wellness programs, theatrical performances, comedies, originals, and more. So I always mention one of my favorite books. And one of my favorite books is a book by Simon Sinek called Leaders Eat Last. It's available on Audible and teaches us how to build a workplace that embraces trust and cooperation by discussing real life examples. So don't forget. Visit us at audibletrial.com backslash vet roundtable for a 30-day trial. All right. We're moving on. We did it. We did it. Woo. Okay. Good job. <laughs> Case collections. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Okay. You go. So we have a, I want to say he's six months old. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Um, a six months old, six month old little dog that we've been watching and kind of keeping an eye on because he's very nervous. He's just a very stressed out little guy. So we've been keeping an eye on him, but mom called and she was like, there's just something wrong with his foot. It doesn't look right. I think he broke his nail. We're not sure. So we brought him in and we tried to take a look and we noticed one of the toenails was sticking like straight up. So we're like, okay, in order to get a good look at him, we're going to have to sedate him just because he's so nervous. We don't want to make it worse. So we ended up sedating him and took some x-rays, thinking that we're going to find that he's potentially either broken the nail or broken the bone in general, mm -hmm. only to find out that nothing's broken. His toe is just what well, it ended up just being deformed, mm -hmm. not quite fully um, developed. And his bone and his nail actually stick straight up <laughs> on one of his paws. So everything else lays normal, but he's just got one constantly hanging out, looking at the sky. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So that was the x-ray you showed me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. That yeah, was interesting. We were like, we were expecting it to be like broken in half or something. And we were preparing the owners like, yeah, we may have to potentially like amputate. Like it could be like up to that. And no, it's just a weird toe. Just a Luckily. weird congenital. <laughs> yeah, he's not, with it. not painful. He doesn't seem to be bothered by it. He's not really trying to lick it or eat it. So it's just going to hang out there. I think. I think we're just going to let it sit there because it's not causing him any pain it's not causing any problems but it's just going to be one toe that just hangs up pointing to the sky okay mm -hmm. it's in the middle right it's in the middle mm -hmm. on so at least it's protected foot. like on both yeah. yeah so it probably won't get snagged on anything then probably i don't think so hopefully not but he's very floofy so mm -hmm. it kind of you don't see it when oh you that's good paw, okay you kind of have to get in there and feel around but the end of the toe between two digits, it's like not attached. That's what you were saying. It's yeah. like loosey goosey. It's very yeah. So if it does cause him problems, we talked about potentially just taking that off. But yeah, we'll see. that's awesome. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. Okay, who's next? Yeah, I can go. Um, so my case is about a four-year-old Old English bulldog, and she presented for second-degree burns to her ear. Oh, wow. And it's very interesting how she got them. Um, so the owners noticed a tick that was on her ear. And I'm assuming they tried to, like, pull it off with pliers and tweezers. It wasn't coming off. So they Googled how to remove a tick at home. And they used isopropyl alcohol to see if the dog would let go. Or not the dog. The tick would let go of the dog's ear that way. Didn't work. And so I can only assume they tried to use a lighter. Oh, and in case you didn't know, um, isopropyl alcohol is flammable, and they unfortunately found out the hard way, and it caught the dog's ear on fire. Um, luckily, they were able to get it out like almost immediately, but it did cause some pretty bad burns. And um, she was the sweetest dog in the world, and she handled everything like a champ. She'd have to come in like I think every three to five days. Um, the skin was like slothing off; oh, it was yeah. really bad. Um, but we would like debride it. We would just sit there and we just have to tell her, "Oh, you're such a good girl," and like pet her. And she would just like wag her tail, kind of roll over, super submissive, super sweet girl. Um, and we would like get everything clean, um, and it would get better one day, and then the next day it wouldn't look too good. And we were like, "Okay, well, maybe we need to culture it." Mom was kind of tight on funds because she had. 
to come in like every like couple days. Sure. And eventually it just healed and we didn't ever have to culture it, thankfully. And as far as I know, the last time I checked in, it she's doing great. Oh, that's but, awesome. Yeah. So just in case you guys didn't know, um, <laughs> isopropyl alcohol is flammable. Um, but yeah, she she's such a sweet girl. And I'm glad it finally healed. So, that's awesome. Yeah. And you do not have to remove ticks with fire. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, you can always uh, find a way to it's come to your local vet and see if they can help. But. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think people in this area always worry like, oh, the head's going to be burrowed under the skin. Yeah. But that's just not a thing. So yeah. Yeah. we don't have to worry about that. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Put the matches down. Yes. <laughs> Set the matches down. Yeah, she was the sweetest dog. And I yeah. know the owners felt so bad that it had happened because I talked to him a lot getting updates and seeing how she was doing. And she is doing fantastic from everything that I've heard from them since. You know what's but... even better is some Perica. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Keep them on a <laughs> so nice, reliable cheaper. prevention. Them for so much cheaper than, yeah. Yep. Yes, but that's hard to learn those lessons that yeah. way. I mean, you know, I mean, people don't obviously don't intentionally intend right. to cause harm, but it seems like that's just like a theme, like, right? Like you try and save money, save time, mm -hmm. save whatever, and then it ends up costing you in the yeah. end. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, yeah. yeah. Unfortunate. Well, I'm glad she's doing well. Yes. Mm -hmm. You and your case is <laughs> <laughs> That's a burns. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Because you've become the queen of fixing burns. I yeah, mean, our two house cat kitties. Oh are yeah. Fantastic and thriving. How are those? Yeah, because we yeah. talked about those at one point. We with the saw mm -hmm. them. I want to say it was a month ago. They came in just for nail trims. Mm -hmm. And Cheeto, the one that doesn't have the ears anymore because we amputated, he's like always in speed mode. I like to call it because he just looks like the most aerodynamic little cat. Right. But they look so good. His ears look fantastic. Oh, that's and he so was cool. just loving everybody when he was here. Yeah. And just, you know, showing off those new little ears and he has hair living his like best life. all the way like almost to the inside of the ear. So it's just like furry little furry ears. head. Yeah. <laughs> furry ears. Really cute. That's so cute. Um, and then the other one's feet too. I mean, every they're all. Oh yeah, when they did her nail trim, I mean, she's feisty as ever because oh, yeah. she was always yeah. when she was a little more lovey. We're like, oh, I'm concerned, but <laughs> she's feisty as ever. But her feet look good when they were trimming her nails. They looked fantastic. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Wow. There's that old saying: just put the cat, all the pieces of the cat, in one room, and it'll heal. Yes. <laughs> Cats are amazing that way. Yeah. Cats are great. They'll do whatever they need. Oh my gosh, Smoke. What about you? So mine, just to preface, has a. Not so great ending, but I thought it was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so mine was an eight-year-old um, male neutered domestic short hair that came in for vomiting, not eating, just for 24 hours. So it was very short period. Um, was lethargic. So we did lab work, and there was a high bilirubin um, value in GGT. So we're thinking, you know, liver issue. At the time, the cat presented, did have a fever, but was not... Uh, like Ectric did not have any yellow discoloration at all. Um, and so we kept the cat here that day to kind of work it up. We took x-rays. Um, and on the x-rays, it was interesting. There were three little uh, round, uh, very hyperechoic, very bright little areas on the x-ray. So we were like, is that in the stomach? Did he eat something? Is that why he's vomiting? But then the more we looked at it, it's like, oh, that would make sense if it's in like the gallbladder biliary tree mm -hmm. and there are stones. But there were multiple of them. Oh, wow. Um, so the next step ideally would have been, you know, to do an ultrasound to confirm. But at that point, the owner didn't really want to go that next step just yet. Um, so... You know, we had him on fluids while he was here. We gave him an antibiotic and an anti-nausea, and his fever got worse. It rose on 105 just in, from him being here, which is not a good sign. And then from the morning to the evening before he went home, he had turned yellow. Mm. Like it was, it was happening quickly. So our immediate concern, even though we couldn't confirm it, was, you know, he had – gallstones that were had tried to pass but were stuck and so causing an obstruction and then you get bile backing up um into the liver and the bloodstream so anyways you know at that point you're kind of there's not a great easy fix to yeah. that so you're stuck with referring to a specialist to do a surgery that's very very expensive um or unfortunately sometimes humane euthanasia is the other alternative um, 
because everything had happened so fast, the owner was not ready to make a decision. So she actually took him home. We sent him home with pain meds, you know, anti-nausea things to help his comfort, you know, essentially. But he did make it through the weekend, but then came back Monday. Um, he ate a little bit over the weekend, but still wasn't doing great. And she wanted to do the ultrasound at that point. So we did. Dr. Dudley did the ultrasound. And at that time, he was very painful, very yellow. Um, his billy or his bile duct actually had ruptured. Mm. So he had bile in his abdomen and peritonitis. And oh, wow. So, yeah, we, after that, it was like, okay, we got to make a decision. So she ended up, you know, euthanizing him. And I think that was the best decision for him. But it's tough because, you know, you get this diagnosis after vomiting because vomiting can go so many so different, many different ways. ways. Oh, my gosh. And yeah. then you're like, okay, well, you know go to the surgeon and even with doing that there's still risk of complications and it you know not fixing the problem so um it was interesting that was the first one i've seen where it's actually like ruptured and yeah not a great ending but it was just interesting no that's a very interesting yeah. case absolutely very cool it's amazing yeah, because vomiting is like on the list of like 50 yeah. mm -hmm. disease processes. She, I think she originally thought it could have been like a foreign body. Like mm -hmm. he liked to play with like hair ties yeah. or something. And so she definitely wasn't expecting it to be that. so dramatic, like yeah. serious, like, yep. yeah, mm -hmm. imminent and imminent danger. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. My case is a eight year old male neutered Australian shepherd mix that had um, a nodule show up on his inside chest um, that formed into a draining track that, um, I don't know, was seen like maybe four months ago. Um, we treated it conservatively and it resolved, but then over the next four months, this dog developed two additional nodules, um, on its, uh, chest and flank area on the same side, chest and flank area on the same side. Those nodules weren't draining or open or anything like that, but they were there. They were firm. They were below the dermis um, in the subcutaneous space. And um, when I aspirated them, I just got white blood cells, some vacuolated neutrophils and just, you know, um, just uh, proteinaceous kind of material like that was very wispy and vacuolated. And so I said, yeah, I have no idea what these are, which is what I say a lot of the time. Let's take these out. And so they weren't normal because they were forming quickly and um, they weren't uh, lipomas. And so then the only way to get a diagnosis would have been to get tissue samples. So we anesthetized him and then got both of those uh, nodules out. And then we also cultured the tissue to rule out infectious agents. And the histopathology came back as um, paniculitis. And then after the aerobic and anaerobic culture came back, and then after the special stains came back, we ruled out um, no infectious agents or neoplastic cells. So he has um, sterile nodular paniculitis which is not very common in dogs, but we, we'll see it from time to time. It basically involves the fat layer, the, the subcutaneous fat layer, like below the skin. And if it gets inflamed, then it forms these nodules or granulomas. And there's all different reasons why it can happen. So it can be infectious agents. So bacteria, it can be fungal. Um, and um, actually, interestingly enough, which I don't remember, um, was it can be caused by pancreatitis as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So dogs that have pancreatitis have an increased incidence of this happening. So he doesn't have pancreatitis or anything like that right now. But going back in his history, he has had episodes of some GI upset. I don't know if it was related to pancreatitis at that point. It it doesn't say either in the research like how quickly those things form after episodes of pancreatitis. So she's going to see a nutritionist just because she wants to try and optimize um, in none of those coming back. And surgery can be curative. So we removed those. There are no others right now, but then you can also treat them with immunosuppressants to decrease the inflammatory condition. So right now he's not on any, he's not on any meds, but that may be something that we have to put him on in order to put him into remission. Mm -hmm. They can be a little uncomfortable too. So like when you palpate, when I palpated them, normally with masses, like when you stick them, they don't care. But like these were sore, mm -hmm. like, yeah. you know, like mm -hmm. it, it, he at least noticed when I was, you know, aspirating them or usually in the subcutaneous space, most the dogs don't care about what you're aspirating. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was really interesting. Yeah. 
I think that's what my dog had. You think that's what yes, your dog had as well? I do. So yeah. when you're talking about this, it's very familiar. Yeah. It's so weird because you... Or something else? She had multiple. Oh. Yeah. Okay. She's trouble. Aww. She's... Yeah. She had another... Yeah. Oh, she gosh. Had one, yeah, she because her neck. Double remember double. her neck, yeah. right? And then her foot. Her and leg, then... which would be a weird spot for that to happen. But then she had another one pop up most recently and... Connor was like, no more surgeries for a year. We made a deal. <laughs> <laughs> he was talking to her. Remember? Otherwise, you got to get a job. He's talking to me. He's oh, like, he's don't talking. take her to surgery. She's on a surgery ban. Oh, um, God. So I so... did. We, we were patient. And it has pretty much resolved. Yeah. I mean, the nodular paniculitis cases, they talk about topically treating them. Sometimes you end up having to use antibiotics on those cases if they're related to infectious agents. But like the sterile ones, it doesn't help you at all to... Yeah. You know, so you just treat like the inflammation, keep the area clean. And a lot of times they regress on their own then. Um, but, you know, that's hard for owners. They don't want a oozing, yeah. you know, like drainage yeah. wound, you know, draining wound. So anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Interesting case. Okay. Those were all good cases. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. On to our listener question. Okay. You want to do it? I can do it. Okay. So the listener question is, says, Hey, my name is Daisy. I'm a first-year veterinary nursing student from the Shetland Islands in Scotland, which is awesome, by the Amazing. way, Amazing. know that yeah. we're that yeah. far. She said, I started watching you guys on TikTok and now frequently listen to your podcast. My question is, how do you handle ethically slash morally conflicting situations? For example, a dog is on supportive care that is only prolonging death. You recommend euthanasia as the best option for the dog's welfare, but the owners refuse euthanasia as it is against their religion. How would you overcome this kind of situation? Love the podcast. It is so informative and interesting. You guys are amazing. And it's from Daisy Manson Brody. Hopefully I said all that right, but thank you because I think yeah, that's thank a you. fantastic mm -hmm. question. Yeah. yeah. It it's really a really is. Good question. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that's a really hard question to answer too because mm -hmm. I think each person is going to be different. Um, like unfortunately, just in this field in general, there are cases to where for whatever reason it may be, um, you can't help the pet. Um, and we have to learn how to cope with that. And so I think it's really important to have like a healthy coping mechanism. Um, so not whiskey. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm mean, just kidding. It helps. It helps. Okay, put it but, down. <laughs> but having a healthy coping mechanism is going to be key. Um, and I think honestly, like advocating for your patients, um, making sure the owners understand like, hey, these are your options that you have making sure they get everything, it helps. Mm -hmm. And then also focusing on the ones that we can help also helps. So like the ones that are healthy that you just have to like, hey, give supportive care or whatever, or even if it's like helping them who mainly pass, um, it helps focusing on them. But it's still also, you're gonna wonder about those patients that you can't help. Like, are they still alive? Are they doing okay? Um, and it sucks not knowing sometimes, mm -hmm. but focusing on the ones that we can help, I think helps. Yeah. yeah. No, that's great advice. Absolutely. I think that from the room assistant side of it, when I have those conversations, a lot of them consist of, I spend a lot of time talking about the patient itself. Um, so I'll have conversations about, you know, how has the dog been doing? What's going on with them? How do you think that they're doing quality of life wise? And yeah, there are some that, you know, we've had them that we've had them on fluids for over a year. They come in multiple times a week and we do things like that. And sometimes it really is just giving the owner that support of, I understand why you don't want to do this and just kind of working with them and saying, that's fine. We will help you do the supportive care. We'll continue the fluids. We'll renew the medications that you need. You know, you can talk to me about anything you have, um, any questions that you have. And some of those owners you get to know really, really well as you're doing that. I had one that did end up turning into a euthanasia that I did with Dr. Faust. We went to their home and it was a family I'd been working with for a year and a half. The dog had not been doing great and then had gotten better and he had, you know, thrived for a while and then very quickly went back downhill. And, you know, we went to his home. He passed very peacefully with the help of Dr. Faust and he was surrounded by, you know, his owners. And when we got back, you know, I was all prepared to help start doing this stuff for the end of the euthanasia. And somebody was like, oh, that's that dog, isn't it? And I lost it. You know, I cried because it's a patient that we honestly thought we could help and we thought we were there. And to be able to have to make that decision to say, you know, 
you know, that's just where we're at and we can't do this. And I spent the two to three days prior to when we did euthanize him talking to the owners about what is he going through? Well, what's your quality of life as well? Because as much as I'm concerned about him, you're not sleeping because you're taking him out every few hours and you're taking him out for an hour at a time in the middle of the night because he's pacing and he's uncomfortable. So you're not sleeping. He's not sleeping. Mm -hmm. And at this point, quality of life for both of you is not good. And it did take some time of just listening to them. I think there was one day I was on the phone with them for half an hour to 45 minutes, just listening to mom talk and explain to me what was going on. And sometimes that's all they need is for me to be able to have that time where I'm not working with a patient because, you know, you guys have all of those other patients that you're working with, you're doing the treatments and things like that. So I deal with a lot of just that personal side of it, of listening to them. So being able to take that time to listen to her talk and her to work through it, I wasn't necessarily saying very much. Mm -hmm. I was just that sounding board of, where is this dog at? And, you know, getting that off her chest of it's been hard, I think helps to be able to just open yourself up to listen to those hard conversations. As awkward as it is to sit there and listen and you know what you want to say to them and what you want to encourage them to do, sometimes you need to be able to sit there and just listen because that's going to be what's going to help them make that decision as well. Yeah. Yeah, I like what you said about like supporting them and just – you know, building a relationship with the clients because then I feel like once you have that, the conversation is a lot better and, you know, they trust you to give them the right recommendation. But, you know, if, if they don't want to euthanize and they're not ready for that, then our job is to support them and just keep the pet comfortable as best we can. And And if they want them to pass on their own, then that is totally fine too. Like we can't, you know, we don't want to sit here and say, these are the things that you need to do. These are your options. And we can just kind of explain what we think the pet is experiencing, but it may not change what yep. they do. And that's totally fine because everyone has a different experience and outlook on euthanasia. And it's very controversial. And we're just here to help them make that decision when they feel like they want to discuss it. Mm -hmm. Um, but it may mean that we're just giving the pet pain medications and anti-nauseas and everything to basically provide hospice care, um, until, you know, it is the end of their time. So yeah, yeah. it's tough. I think, you know, you're right. It's a highly charged, um, topic. And so if someone is, uh, a religious objection or a moral objection to pursuing euthanasia for their pet, there's nothing you're going to say or do to change mm -hmm. that. And that's okay because that's how – that's their that's their view of what they're providing for their pet so that when they meet their maker, they feel like they've done what they, they should be doing. So it's not on us to try and change that per se um, as much as then, like you're mentioning, Schmoke, like provide care. And you guys have said like provide care at the end of the life – of their life so that their pet is as comfortable as possible. So I think – you know, to your question, how do you wrap your brain around basically when it's the best option for the dog? Because we don't. So what we're sitting here in the field saying is we don't have hospice care. We don't have the ability to allow the pet to p pass peacefully on their own. So we know all of this. And this is all the things that we know that we carry around. And so then it's hard for us. And I'm sure it's hard for Daisy to sit and watch then the pet not have what it need, you know what I mean? Or it's, she's considering that it's suffering. So then, then there, you're at odds, you know, um, because you feel like the pet's suffering and the owner thinks that we're doing a disservice by euthanizing the pet, then, you know, you can't round that square. There's no way to fix that. So I think you have to figure out how to best support the owner and the patient as best as you can. Yeah. And I like what you said too about then you can't carry that guilt home no, with you. Yeah, that, that didn't go the way you thought maybe it should because that's ultimately mm -hmm. the client's, you know, choice. Yep. So And I think that's where it's hard is that with some of those patients we do we take them home with us. And, you know, definitely after that one I did with Dr. Faust, I cried because it was somebody that I had spent a year and a half building a relationship with. And obviously it's harder on the owners than it is on us. But there's still 
that, you know, heaviness that weighs on your heart. So yeah, I cried. And then after a couple of days, you know, I was okay and I was able to move on, but they're always going to have a special place that mm-hmm. I hold on because yeah. he was such a sweet dog. He was a dog that everybody in the clinic knew. And I think that that's kind of what you have to remember is that when we do have those hard cases, you want to remember the good times as much as you can and, you know, get excited about the future of, are they going to get a new pet? Um, how are they going to move on? And it really is just, how can you support them through one of the harder times that they're going to deal with in a pet's life? Because we can educate them as much as we want, but really what they need is that support to either say, yes, you're making the right decision by euthanizing or I understand where you're coming from by not euthanizing. Let me support you and your pet as they transition as peacefully and naturally as you can. Yeah. And I think, you know, her question about how do you handle ethically and moral, morally conflicting situations? I mean, I think, you know, at the end of the day, we, you know, we have this saying here, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. So the way you handle those situations, in my opinion, is you have to be willing to talk about them because you may be addressing something that doesn't even need to be addressed, or you may miss something that you didn't know needed to be addressed. And so being able to have a conversation with an owner in an uncomfortable situation so that you can make sure you're tackling the right thing or leaving something alone that doesn't need to be tackled, um, I think is really, really important to understand that you you're at the root of whatever it is that the conflict may be, you know, mm-hmm. so... I know Having that, those conversations is really important. And I know that when we're learning, um, when you're teaching us things here, we do a lot of role playing, which I feel like helps be, to be able to have those conversations. When I had started on phones, taking those harder phone calls, you know, they would, Terry would pretend to call me and be like, okay, I'm so and so and I need to schedule euthanasia. Well, she helped walk me through how to have those conversations so that I could get the information I needed while still being genuine and compassionate. And so I feel like just being able to do that role play with somebody that you trust to how would I have that conversation if it's going to be awkward and I know that I'm uncomfortable having it, find somebody you trust to role play that with you so that you can practice what your verbiage would be. How would you address that? And how would you address any questions they have so that when it does come and the time is there that you're talking to a client, you've already kind of gone through it in your mind so that you're a little more comfortable than them coming out of left field and you have no answers. Well, I think, you know, some clients are like, well, I'm I'm never going to consider euthanasia. And then we leave it alone. That's what I'm talking about Mm -hmm. is saying, well, tell me what your objection is to euthanasia. Oh, the last, because you come there, the answers will be endless from the standpoint of, you know, the last pet I euthanized, it went horribly. Mm -hmm. Or it could be a religious, you know, you know, um, objection. It could be, you know, I don't want to be with them. I mean, there could be, a th- there could be a mm-hmm. thousand things and you may not. Whereas if you take the time to say, tell me what your objection is, tell me what, you know, why, um, you're, uh, resisting potentially ending, you know, the suffering via humane euthanasia. What is it about that that bothers you? And actually taking the time to listen to the person and have them voice what their objections are so that you can manage and, I mean, what a privilege to be able to say, to ease the burden from the other person, if it is something that they're carrying that then you can take away from them, you know, um, so that they can then be with their pet and it passes peacefully when they didn't really think that would ever be an option because of a previous experience. Mm -hmm. But if we don't take the time to ask, we never know. Yeah. So, yeah, that would be my biggest piece of advice to her. Yeah. Ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talk to them about it. See. Yeah. What where the objection stems from? What is the reason? Is it religious or is it something more emotional? Yeah, absolutely. Anybody have anything else to add? Great question. Yeah. Yep. Great question, Daisy. Thank you so much. We hope you're listening in Scotland. Yes. (laughs) Keep listening. Do you want me to do the outro? You want to do the outro? I can do it. You do it. I got it. this. You okay. Got, okay. So thank you so much for listening um, to another episode of the Veterinary Roundtable. Remember, send in your questions and be sure to follow us on all of our social media platforms at All Star Veterinary Clinic. If you enjoyed this episode or a previous episode, leave us a review on your podcast provider of choice. We'll see you in a few weeks for the next episode of the Veterinary Roundtable. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.